rest of hopefully many more episodes where I'll be interviewing close friends of mine that are doing interesting work in hard sciences and machine learning. So I want to introduce you to Joseph Bakarji, who's been a close friend of mine for many years now. We first met at UCSD when I was a master's student, and he definitely made the process and the whole experience a lot more sane for me. Um, since then, Joe's been up to a, a bunch of different stuff, but uh, most recently he's been a PhD student at Stanford working energy sciences. Uh, and his work is mainly focused around using machine learning to model granular, pro granular material like sand. And so I thought we'd get Joe on to kind of talk about his perspective as to where he sees machine learning helping in the hard sciences and how can hard scientists potentially uh, help, help machine learning. And this is going to be free form, so we welcome any questions from the audience. So feel free to interrupt us at any point. And, you know, thanks again. Joe, thanks for coming on. Hey, Mark, how are you? Good. Thank you for having me. It's uh, actually, I miss talking to you. So it's a nice opportunity to have a chat now. I feel and, the same way. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's also a, like a subject that I've been thinking about for a while. And now I'm, I'm graduating soon, actually. So I'll be working also in, during my postdoc on a, on a machine learning for uh, for science in general. Basically, it's covering physical laws and uh, understanding physical systems using machine learning. And um, and I think it's a huge subject to discuss in general. Uh, so it's like uh, you know, it's like asking you know how what do you think about machine learning and, and sure. like, uh, so many so many subtopics. Yeah, so, so 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 maybe I, I can I can kind of help out here. Like, so so my understanding of how a lot of hard sciences work is that like people would like you know they want to explain some sort of new phenomena, and then like the existing theories don't fit uh, this new data, and so you keep collecting data, and then my understanding is people just like kind of make up some differential equations. I don't know how they they go about doing these exactly, and I and I know for the most part you've mentioned to me that most differential equations aren't really solvable, um, and, and so is that where you see machine learning helping in, in this process? So yeah, I think so. The disruption in the sciences has started since the you know the beginning of computers, computer computational sciences, and especially with the discovery of nonlinear sciences. Uh, it's not really discovered, but it's become it's become more important with uh, the ability to simulate things on the computer. So there are a lot of so physics is mostly about um, modeling systems with differential equations, and a lot of these differential equations are impossible to solve by hand analytically, and the only way to solve them is on computers. So that's how that's what we call simulation sometimes we just simulate reality or a physical system with uh, differential equations and. Uh, these nonlinear differential equations um, that are not solvable by hand, uh, they exhibit really chaotic behavior sometimes. Sometimes they're unpredictable. Even if you have the equation, um, it's very sensitive to initial conditions. That's what's called a chaotic system. And uh, and it's, it's just recently, basically in the 70s, 60s, 70s, that this, uh, this aspect of science has been discovered, which is... Um, the fact that a lot of interesting systems are really sensitive to initial conditions and that even though we have the laws for them, uh, they're unpredictable in the long in the long run. And uh, so that's when also, of course, studying these systems uh, has become the only way to study them is really through simulation. And of course, um, this is combined with um, a lot of effort that's being done in solving these equations because solving them might be very hard mm -hmm. and um, and so studying these systems recently has become so before traditionally it's been you know you do experiments uh, you derive some physical laws and you try to solve the equations by hand to see if you know the trend of the function in, on paper looks like the trend of the function in reality and then you try to improve that basically it's it is sort of like a human driven machine learning because mm -hmm. you collect data, you come up with the equations yourself and then you try to fit to get the best fit. And and the purpose is the same as machine learning. Again, it's generalization, right? You want your equations to generalize to as many cases as possible. And the, the you know the physicist's dream is to find the unifying equation of everything, the equation that solves for everything. But of course that traditional perspective like Einstein's and Laplace and Newton all these uh, 
classical science has changed because of many reasons. One of them is chaotic systems that's been discovered recently. Another, you know, um, multi-scale systems that you know physics looks very different at different scales, and then you can you cannot really have a unifying theory that describes all the scales. And uh, and so a computer is changing a lot in that equation. And recently, I think in that kind of background, uh, machine learning. Um, has become very important because of two factors, and one one is uh, the ability to collect a lot of data, so better measurement devices, better, um, faster sampling, faster. So you just you can collect data very fast, and the other one is uh, you know much much faster computers. So these computers can now simulate really complex systems and parallel using parallel computing and all these, uh, and so you can use. So neural networks, for example, I mean, that happened to neural networks. It was invented uh, decades ago, but it only became, uh, you know, useful uh, in the last decade just because computers can handle that much computational uh, requirement. Interesting. Like, I think, um, so I was taking a bunch of notes while you, while you were talking, and I noticed like a bunch of different interesting uh, themes you talked about. Um, so one, so so one, I, I guess I want to talk about as you said, it's easier to collect more data now, and and I want to maybe elaborate more on this point because um, if you look at like let's say domains like natural language processing, like it's easy to collect data because you can use the internet, or like you know it's easy to get images because you can just like look at Instagram for example. Well, what does that look like for the hard sciences? Because like let's say in in the case of something like SANS, I would still imagine you need to. I don't know, pay a grad student to go outside and measure stuff in, in a lab and stuff. So what is what does that process look like now? So, I mean, again, so when it comes to like physics, very hard sciences where you have, you need a, a maybe hydron, like, a, you know, a linear uh, accelerator to, you know, collide particles and collect data from like, I mean, this is actually not easy at all. And hmm. I don't think so. In a lot of sciences, the data is still sparse. It's, it's still limited. And that, you know, machine learning, and that's where, for example, machine learning is controversial because it's becoming very popular in, in the sciences. And then you have some people in the sciences that, that are like, you know, yeah, but in our field, we don't, we can't collect that much data. So all this neural networks and, you know, these techniques that require a lot of data aren't useful for us. And so... In, in, in some cases, actually, the science, it's machine learning, you know, only marginally has uh, an effect on the sciences and uh, you still have very little data and you still need to use techniques that don't require a lot of data, not neural networks, but other maybe fitting uh, mm -hmm. uh, techniques. So uh, it's, it's in the sciences where you can collect a lot of data, like where you have sensors that are attached to, um, for example, sensors in a river or in an ocean, my atmospheric sensors. So uh, where you can get a lot of data and aggregate it very fast because of the internet. For example, internet of things kind of sensors, right? So let's say I have a sensor for the temperature or for the speed of the wind everywhere in, in, in the United States. And then I can collect these in real time. And uh, by tracking the wind in real time, I, can, I have a model of the atmosphere uh, and then I can basically predict what the weather is going to be in tomorrow, for example, that's, mm -hmm. you know, one application, but, you know, there are a lot of other applications like uh, on a ship, for example, or on a rocket, let's say you uh, the rocket is flying up straight and you have data that's being collected at a very high rate mm -hmm. of the thrust and the wind speed, uh, the control. Uh, so all of these, and then you're trying to control them in real time. So this goes more into control theory. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so again, so a lot of techniques in machine learning, which I mean are called now machine learning, have existed in the sciences, uh, in some parts of sciences for a long time. And they were called data assimilation, for example, where you would uh, have an equation, you have some unknowns in the equation and you want to fit those unknowns. Uh, so you use data assimilation. That's for example, in the or flow in porous media, they call it data assimilation. Say um, you have aquifer contamination and you're trying to know how the contaminants are flowing in the aquifer and you, you can collect data in some spots and you try to fit the you know, concentration or the diffusivity of the 
of the aquifer. And so you use some data assimilation and that was basically machine learning. And, 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 and so, 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 so let me just ask a clarifying question here because because I always found this point interesting. Like I think you mentioned uh, kind of initially that a lot of systems of differential equations are unsolvable. Uh, and then we kind of said, well, you know, maybe machine learning can help you figure out some of the unknowns in those equations. So I think that, that that in of itself is an interesting question. But a kind of a question I personally always had was like, how do people come up with these equations in the first place? Like they kind of generally to me seem like they're pulled out of a hat. Uh, like they look fairly complex. Like it's it, like you don't look at it and you're like, oh, this is obviously the equation. It's more like, you know, you recognize the equation and then you try to fit it to other problems that look the same. Uh, so how do you think people just came up with these like initially? Like what, what right. do you think? So, so uh, I mean, there's a history to it, but like Newton's law, for example, is kind of pulled out. Of it. So there are things that are basic and basically axioms of, of physics. And these are, you know, discovered, you know, people find these relationships and the thing about science, and that's why, you know, machine, like uh, machine learning infiltrating the sciences is a little, uh, there's a little friction there is because in physics, people have been working for, you know, centuries on discovering relationships that are very simple, but that are extremely generalizable, like the same law, which is Newton's law can apply to, you know, a falling apple from a tree as much as, you know, uh, planets mm. or and uh, and of course it has limits it doesn't generalize for example to high speeds because there you would need einstein's uh, like general relativity uh, but still general relativity now applies to everything and they assume that it applies to everything even to the beginning of the universe so of course every, i mean by experience we know that everything uh, has limits but uh, of course uh, but that's the idea is that in physics these uh, relationships are extremely generalizable now, uh, some principles that are used are very intuitive and they, for example, conservation laws. So conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, which is related to Newton's law, con conservation of energy. So we know that, you know, when we measure energy, energy is always the same. And so we use these principles to build more and more complicated laws. So for example, uh, Navier-Stokes equation, which models a fluid flow. It's a very nonlinear equation and it looks very hard and you cannot solve it by hand and people even don't know if it has a unique solution or whatever. But it models fluids really well, and it's built from very basic principles. It's built from, it's a conservation of momentum equation, which seems to generalize, it's a principle that applies to all physical systems, at least as far as we can tell. And uh, it's, a, um, it's often used with conservation of mass. And uh, it, okay, it has assumptions, but you can relax these assumptions and get more sophisticated fluids, like non-Newtonian fluids. Um, but anyway, the idea is that even though these questions look sophisticated, they're built on very generalizable, uh, very generalizing principles, which is conservation laws and things like that. And that's the difference with like just simply fitting an equation. Mm -hmm. so it's, a, it's a sort of fitting, but it's a fitting that's based on, um, you know, very general principles. I mean, yeah, like it, it, it seems interesting to me because like when, when I think of the typical machine learning task, like let's say <clears throat> like I train some sort of image classifier on cats, I, I don't expect it to work well on dogs. Like I expect my data to contain both dogs and cats uh, versus like in, in physics, it seems that like the identity of, of the object is kind of irrelevant and you can abstract this away with more general features like right. <clears throat> like your mass, like your weight, like your speed. And and like these details kind of become irrelevant, um, right? I think I think so. That's the thing that uh, the way I think about it is that um, so in physics you have a lot of assumptions that are deterministic. But these are like the conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, let's say, and or Newt and Newton's laws. So whatever these assumptions are, which are modeled in terms of equations, are they're they're very generalized and they're very deterministic in that sense because they they generalize. Um, while in machine learning, um, first your systems are much more complicated, nonlinear, like language, and mm -hmm. so there, uh, and there are no underlying principles that easily generalize to all of. Uh, sorry, I want to interrupt you there because, like, I think that in of itself is 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 an interesting question to me. Like, could you kind of explain in a 
sort of like beginner friendly way like what, what does like what does nonlinear mean and why is it so much harder than than linear like because this is a term i think i hear a lot of scientists use to mean complex but i want to hear like if, if uh, your take on it it's a good question yeah i think i mean it's used a lot and it's funny it's a funny word i, I always think funny because it's like uh, the word means the negation of some other word which is uh-huh. linear <laughs> <laughs> and and the reason is that linear is simple usually linear like my friend always says that uh, you know we're wired to only think linearly we're our brains only think in a linear fashion and that's uh, so so the thing with linear equations is that if a linear a linear equation is simple to solve or we know our techniques general techniques for solving linear equations that's not true for nonlinear equations so that's one thing about the difference mm-hmm. now ma- more mathematically a linear equation is um, if you have uh, the sum of two linear equations of a function is uh, so the solution. The sum of the solution is equal to the the equation applied to the sum of the inputs, right? So the sum of the inputs when you apply the function to it, you get you know the outputs. You can sum up the outputs. Mm-hmm. Basically, that's uh, so you can decompose the inputs oh. into smaller units you can solve all the smaller units separately and then you can sum up the outputs if it's linear that you can do that uh, it- that's interesting because like there's a similar analog in computer science where like problems that you can break apart easily like you can solve via recursion or dynamic programming but problems where you cannot uh, right. decompose them end up becoming like np complete because in the worst case you need to look at all possible permutations of a problem exactly. yeah, yeah exactly uh, that's interesting yeah, that's what the difference is between linear and nonlinear. it's basically if you can break it down or not um so so and, and so that gets to, like another issue where like you know because uh, often like when we say like can we solve a problem like that's different from can we solve it efficiently and so just like as a sort of hypothetical thought experiment, like let's say I gave you a billion dollars in, uh, you know, compute costs from AWS and Azure. And I was like, here you go. Here's a team of 10 star graduate students slash researchers. Uh, do you think then something like the Navier Stokes problem can be solved? And, and if so, why not? Like, like what are really the impediments for actually solving a problem like this? So, um, I mean, it depends what... The- so the Navier Stokes, the problem with Navier Stokes is that there's no proof for uh, the fact that it has a unique solution, or or if uh, you know it always has a unique solution, or if it sometimes fails to have any solution. So it's a mathematical problem, and actually, you know, engineers don't really care. Even scientists don't, don't care about the answer to that question because it's a purely mathematical question. It's not a really practical question. I think when it, when it comes to compute power, uh, the, uh, you, you can find mostly in like granular materials, something that I do. So let's say you're trying to simulate a granular material that has uh, you know, small grains, and then you know each grain, what the properties are, and you know that the forces between them, you can use Newton's laws or whatever, and you're compressing them, let's say, or they're flowing grains. Now, I need to compute the forces between every two com- uh, grains next to each other, right? And you know that if, if let's say, only the grains, if there's gravity forces, I mean, in, in grains, there are no gravity forces, but let's say there are body forces between all the different grains, that's, you know, n cube, like it grows, it, it grows polynomial, but uh, it grows very fast as n grows. Mm-hmm. So, so, and typically, let's say a normal system would have, you know, at the order of, hundred thousand to a million grains mm-hmm. and I, I take a, a million grains and bring it to the power cube right uh, or squared between square and cube and then that's like really expensive so the problem is that a lot of physics problems and uh, become you know grow really fast in such a way that even parallel computers and with very high computational power cannot solve like it Again, it be, they become NP hard, where you know sometimes they grow exponentially, and so you know you just need exponentially more time to solve them, and that's mm. uh, not feasible. So often it makes much more sense to use statistical methods, where I mean I don't care what happens to each grain, I care about you know the average behavior. So that's where coarse graining comes in. I try to average the behavior, 
and still capture the important features without losing the details of the grain. Um, like, like, does this idea generalize outside of something like granular media, like, or, or anything in fluids? Yes. So, I mean, again, fluids, you can look at molecules and you can look at, uh, you know, vortices and you can look at the, the whole bulk behavior. So there's always in any physical system and even a lot of non-physical systems like logic systems or whatever, uh, you have a lot of uh, multi-scale behavior. So you have, you know, at one scale, something is happening. And if you want to to compute all the details of that scale, all the electrons, all the atoms, all the grains, then it's too expensive computationally. And it doesn't make sense to compute it, to, comp uh, to, to compute every single grain when it's moving. So you want to average out that behavior and get the bulk behavior at the larger scale. And so, for example, that's true for networks, right? Uh, and computer systems. Like you want to know where um, the networks are failing, how much statistically they're failing, etc. So maybe you want to get the bigger picture of the system. You don't want to know exactly where the routers are failing, but where the regions of routers are failing. So an average behavior. So traffic flow is also like, you don't want to look at each car where it's moving. You want to know the density of cars where, where, um, where it is. So. And I think this is where, for example, that's what I'm doing. And that's what a lot of people are trying to do is uh, trying to understand these multiple scales, multi-scale systems um, by coarse graining. And traditionally, coarse graining has been, there are techniques for that also hom called homogenization or, uh, or coarse graining in physics. And like statistical mechanics is all about that, how to you know, get a microscopic equation for or something that you know how it works microscopically and machine learning can actually uh, is promising in that direction where you know the system's microscopic behavior and you don't know how to get the microscopic behavior analytically but simulate the particles and then you have some machine learning algorithm that discovers a lower dimensional system which is you know a coarser grained or a microscopic uh, equation that describes uh, this average behavior of, of the particles. Uh, so th th there's a few interesting themes you touched on that remind me of some ideas in machine learning. Like one uh, is this idea of differing scales. Like, And I see this idea particularly in image recognition algorithms where like the earlier layers correspond to like these lower level features like edges or roundedness or blurriness. And then the higher level layers will correspond to objects right. like... Uh, cats and dogs so, so i'm assuming like you're also saying that like physics sort of has this hierarchy but the hierarchy is sort of hand-coded um and, right. then, and, then, and then i guess like the other idea you talked about is uh like this idea of si simulating low-level stuff and then figuring out how to aggregate it to to higher level stuff uh i think like we're also like this kind of reminds me a bit of like when people talk about bayesian inference for example where like you have some sort of prior on what you believe your model is and then you slowly check if it validates your data and then update your model correspondingly uh, so and i think it's a good segue into, into my, my my another question i had which is like typically in, in something like bayesian inference like you know you start with a prior but your prior could be wrong and then your prior is wrong depending on what your data is uh how, how does this happen in, in physics really because like let's say w once you've like fixated then you're like well i believe that the way to model fluids is the navier stokes equation like well like how do you really know that you're modeling it the correct way like is is, is that something you I think, think that, about again the, the the classical way when i say classical it's just like centuries old mm -hmm. it, it, you have experiments right you measure things and then the measurements don't agree with the theory so you have to just the theory, mm -hmm. just the theory. So it's unexplainable by the theory. Mm -hmm. And the, the nice thing about, I think that's another thing that you know scientists are aware about from about machine learning is that the, the nice thing about um, science, scientific mathematical laws, they're very interpretable and they're very exportable. You know, you can take them out in terms of symbols and then you can manipulate them. It's like logic systems. It's more like the traditional AI mm -hmm. way where you know, just like manipulate symbols in order to get some more general uh, principles. And, um, and then you also validate that with data. So there is, you know, in science, there's both the data part, it's data informed, it's data driven. And at the same time, it's also symbolic. And I think, you know, machine learning will become, will get, 
I mean, should have also to combine these uh, two perspectives, the deterministic symbol manipulation um, way of doing things and also the data-driven, like purely fitting way of doing things. And uh, um, so, so um, again, so the assumption that it always applies is based on experience. So you take a law and then it always applies. And then, of course, it doesn't apply in some cases. And then this is where, you know, that's what research in science is. You're like, oh, wait, but we assume that it applies here, but obviously it doesn't apply here. So therefore, I'm going to generalize it. I'm going to come up with a more general theory. And they will, you know, get more general assumptions. And they will try to derive it by hand, of course, mm -hmm. you know. Because, uh, but increasingly now, uh, the generalizations are being... Uh, at least now scientists, some scientists try to use uh, computers in general, like simulation based generalization or, you know, machine learning and other computation. So, so, so this is interesting because because in machine learning, generalization has a specific meaning in the sense that like, how good is your trained model on your test data? Right. Uh, but in the sciences, I think it means something slightly different where like, let's say one way to generalize an equation would be like add more terms to it. Another way to generalize an equation would be some sort of branching condition where you're like, well, if I'm at this scale, it's this is the formula. And if I'm at this other scale, then this is the correct formula. Uh, do you see a way of consolidating these two meanings? Do you think they're at all similar or are they unrelated? Yes, I, don't, I don't think they are different. I mean, they're not that different. I think that the test set in, in uh, the sciences is, is, you know, again, by hand, you go and collect more experimental data, and then you test your theory on, on this data, and then you wait until it fails, right? Like Popper would say is that you cannot prove that the theory is right, you can only prove it to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And so as long as it applies, as long as it works, then it's correct, or, or it's not wrong. And then when you apply it to something where it fails, then it's wrong, right? Uh, in, in machine learning, you have a more systematic way of doing that, you get a big data set, and then you split it, and then you you have you leave. You hope that your test set. So again, I think there is this interpolation extrapolation argument that you know is a neural network or a machine learning algorithm interpolating or extrapolating to make sure that it extrapolates. Is you you have this test set on the side, mm -hmm. but what if the test set is really part of the same distribution as the training set? And sometimes, actually, I think it often happens where. You know, you you learned your machine learning. It works really well on your test set. And then you go out in the field and you try to apply it to some real world problem, and it fails because obviously your test set wasn't exactly uh, generalizing to your real world application. So you needed to sample better, like just like there was bias in your sample. And I think that's exactly the same in science. So you you, you take an experiment, you control your variables, and you try to make it work for something specific, and then Again, you have a bias because the system that you're experimenting on is has specific scales, specific quantities that uh, don't apply in other you know, outside certain realm. Um, of science. So, so, so th th that's that's really interesting, and it kind of makes me think that. Uh, so, so I, I've been noticing this trend. I mean, it's not it's not a new trend. I think it's been happening for the past couple of years in machine learning. Uh, where different papers to make claims that they fit their test data better than their predecessors will introduce a lot of complexity. So, for example, they'll use more complex architectures, they'll spend more money on compute, uh, they'll have more complicated training mechanisms. Uh, but then, like, once you look, but, but ultimately, because machine learning is an empirical science at this point, it kind of doesn't matter because you have to just be like, like, you just have to do what, like, what do you think is best on your data? independent of your notions of simplicity and beauty. Uh, have you noticed a similar trade-off in, in the hard sciences uh, lately? Because uh, based on my observation from at least like, let's say, high school physics, uh, a lot of the theories are simple. Uh, but but I guess now if you're fitting these models with data, I would imagine a lot of these models are more complex. So how do scientists decide what is simple and what is complex today? Yes. Uh, yeah, there is the debate that especially with now neural networks, some people use like physics called physics informed neural networks. So they try to solve equations or fit data, physical data with neural networks. And, uh, you know, like neural networks are extremely like nonlinear. They're really good at fitting any kind of data that you give them, even if the function has a shock and some like weird 
features, while uh, you know traditional, uh, you know simple equations will will not be that sophisticated. Of course, I mean if they're if they're nonlinear, they can also exhi exhibit some complexity. But um, so there is this problem with science is that uh, scientists are used to interpretable models, and uh, um, and there is the same effect, of course, yeah, at some point. So you have some equation, right? And uh, you say, okay, it doesn't apply to this specific problem. So people come up with a more complicated equation, bigger, you know, more features. Then someone else says, you know, no, this doesn't apply to this. So they try to relax the assumptions. And as they relax the assumptions, the, the model becomes more and more sophisticated. But with at some point of sophistication, it becomes hard to verify if, you know, the sophistication is necessary, right? So you're you're, you're over, at some point you're overfitting. You're getting an equation that applies to a very specific case, and it's you know it's not clear if it's true or not. Maybe it's not unique, right? The equation will not be unique anymore. It'll become you can have different functions or different equations that describe the same phenomenon. Like yeah, but, you have an algorithm. You no longer just have an equation that would describe a system. Right. Also, yeah. So so. And also, this is where uncertainty becomes important because you might have you know, a very precise question that describes a uh, phenomenon in, in very fine details, but uh, there's no way to verify it because uh, you know you have a lot of uncertainty and there's no way to measure it, right? So in that case, there's no data for it. Or, uh, for example, so, the atom, like the position of an atom in in a um, bucket of fluid, right? Uh, so you're like, I can't measure the atoms, even if I have a model of how the atoms will move. It's not very useful. It's overfitting. That's interesting. Um, and so that kind of makes me think now that like, uh, I think this has been uh, like a recurring criticism I've had of, of many machine learning papers that like everyone basically says it's sort of a similar claim, like, okay, my results are state of the art and my results are interpretable where I define interpretable as the weights of a logistic regression model or as the visualization of the weight matrix uh, or uh, because there's not many parameters or like, and, and so it becomes really subject to interpretation what interpretable actually means. And so do you feel like the hard sciences have a precise definition or is it also similarly up to interpretation? So, uh, I think interpretable, at least in the sense of the hard sciences, at least my my, my uh, definition is uh, it's exportable. Uh, so you can so so a neural network a neural network will learn something really well, uh, but then it fails, let's say, or uh, in some cases, or it's uh, you want to generalize it to other cases, like it's learning cats and dogs, but you want to learn also. Uh, uh, elephants, or or, uh, and you want to know how it learned cats and dogs, so that you can, you know, make it learn more animals, and uh, you know, tweak it a little, so that it can generalize it better. But if it's not something you can, you know, open and then see what's happening, and so as a human, it's basically understandable to a human. That's what interpretable is. Uh, then you know, then you cannot work with the computer to to improve your 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 function or your theory. Uh, that's uh, so machine learning algorithms that are interpretable, which is again what I do. For example, I try to learn equations. So you use machine learning to learn an actual equation for the probability distribution. And uh, so if I learn the equation, then I can take that equation and say, oh wait, look, there's a diffusion term here. What is the actual diffusion term doing? Oh look, there is this thing, and I know from you know math theory like what these mean oh look the equation is conservative it means it's conserving this quantity that's mm -hmm. important and then i can take this equation i can manipulate it i can put it in another machine learning algorithm so i can collaborate with the computer on discovering a better theory so this collaboration i think in a lot of at least in science is important if you don't have this collaboration and then the computer has to do everything on its own you know maybe at some point it'll be really good that it won't need a human input but so far, there has to be some kind of collaboration, and that's where interpretability comes in. So uh, I, I want to pause yeah. you right there for a second. I think there's two key ideas that I want to resume here. So one was uh, the idea of predictive performance. I think this is a very pragmatic definition because you're also saying, I don't care if it looks complicated 
as long as it lets me do good predictions. And I think this is definitely a sentiment that's shared in the deep learning community more so than the classical AI community. And I think the other one you said is this idea of be, of human guided uh, insight. I also think is interesting. But I guess like before we dive deep, we actually have a question from uh, Sudo Maze in, in chat. Uh, mm-hmm. So Sudo Maze wants to ask you. So uh, do you think uh, that approximation using deep learning methods is better than hard coded logic methods for more complex systems? And then why or why not? So approximation, can you read again? Approximation. Yeah. One moment, I was doing charge. So yeah, so he asks, uh, do you think that the approximation, uh, ap- approximation using deep learning methods is better than hard-coded logic methods for more complex systems? And then why or why not? Okay, so yeah, I mean, um, well, I think, the last few years have proved that for a lot of systems at least like say language and translation and and image recognition and all of these obviously deep learning methods are way superior to logic systems where i mean you try to manipulate what what each word is saying and then properties so that i think that's you know like uh, there's evidence that uh, deep learning methods do much better uh, but i think that Ultimately, a combination of both would be ideal, in some systems at least, uh, where you want to have some fitting of data in general, but you also want to have more, uh, you know, deterministic uh, manipulation of symbols, and this um, will might become more. Uh, so again, so some I think if you want to think about it in a scientific uh, perspective, that. Uh, some parts of science you just fit right you come up with an equation that fits the data and you don't know why that fit happened right and this is conservation law is for example like this it's a very basic uh, law but it's just something that we observed so we took the observation and then we we came up with an equation for it and then it always applies and then this assumption is much more deterministic and i can treat it as a logical principle uh, to derive more you know uh, less less obvious observations that for example let's say i uh, see the wind blowing on a tree and then the tree's leaves are moving in a certain way and these you know are kind of there's a lot of noise there and and i want to fit a function to you know the motion of the leaves but i know this principle that there's still conservation of mass so if i use that now my search space right my optimization algorithm will converge better then if I don't use this uh, principle. So I can, like people do that by putting um, these, for example, the conservation law in the uh, objective function. So I know that the, the system is conserved. So I kind of shrink my hypothesis class and it helps my fitting algorithm, whatever it is, converge much faster. So, so this is very similar again to the idea of, uh either like regular, like it's similar to the idea of regularization, right? In ML, where instead of just saying, oh, I want my weights to be small, you're saying like, I want my weights to be small, but I also want to have like, let's say conservation of momentum be part of the objective function because I believe that this is relatively true and predictive in general. Yes, I Um, think, by the way, that's how like most of the physics informed machine learning, a lot of it at least happens through this adjusting the objective function. And like you know, putting more physics information there. Interesting. Um, I mean, so so yes. Yeah, so the natural question is like, how much do you add to this objective function, right? Like, if you add basically all prior knowledge of physics, uh, what would what what do you think that would look like? And is that like a realistic research direction? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, so the the problem, I don't know if also adding everything in the objective function is enough because. Let's say if I add a loss uh, for the conservation of mass, uh, the solution is not going to conserve mass exactly. It's just going to con- it's going to try to conserve mass as, as much as possible. It's just not going to do it exactly. And uh, so, I see. so again, it's not deterministic. That's the thing with machine learning. It it will give you, you know, approximate. It will try to fit as much as you want as as it can. It will try to minimize the objective function. But if it has contradictions, if it has some some things that you know don't fit together it would still converge to some minimum and you don't know if that minimum is the best you can get or not right 
I mean, yeah, like I think and there's a second challenge, right? Like you don't even know if the contradiction is valid or not, because that could be right. like, like may, may, maybe there is a contradiction with your laws, but maybe there isn't. And, and if, if there is, you want to be able to reject solutions, which right. today, as far as I know, is not like a standard ML thing. Like, right. it's, I guess you would look at all the solutions and then filter them out manually or label them out manually. But it's definitely not programmatically where you can go say, well, conservation of masses, uh, you know, contradicted by 90 percent like like what does that really mean and it doesn't seem like it's something inherently useful for you to do yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so so yeah i mean let, let's so let's talk it like i think this was a good segue into where i interrupted you earlier b- before the question which was uh this idea of human uh assisted physics uh and, and i kind of want to get some sense like do you mind elaborating on like what that is and what are some like productive directions that you've seen in the past that actually uh like like utilize some of these ideas yeah so again i think what i'm working on is this um, you know i i i know for example that so there's a system that has some uncertainties and i know that system it's very complicated like granular materials i know that system has an evolution equation for the probability density function that's for example like a kinetic theory for gases, like you have the Boltzmann equation. But what 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 happens with like more complex systems like granular materials? And uh, you know, there's no way to kind of get it by hand, or it's too complicated. So what I do is uh, I try to discover the equation using machine learning. So I have simulation data, and then I try to estimate the PDF. And then I can use uh, I have a dictionary. Uh, basically, my features will be derivatives of this. Uh, probability distribution function and then i'll just use uh, uh, regression linear regression with sparse regularization so so that i can get only the relevant terms so that's uh, one way where you know i'm discovering an equation that i cannot do analytically but i can only do numerically so uh, so, so so let's stress a bit on this point because i think even for me like the the algorithm you described is a bit sounds a bit strange to me so I guess like some one really like let's say you have ten features like let's say weight mass or like the the size of a grain of sand or whatever, uh, and then uh, like those could each potentially be features and let's say just the the real number basically for that feature, but it sounds like you're also doing more complex stuff where you're also like in your feature set you have derivatives of these terms and co-derivatives of these terms, so it, it sounds like you have this sort of large exhaustive space right and then you're kind of like navigating the space of all possible differential equations for the system based off of a dictionary of possible uh, equations. Is, is that accurate? And if so, like, what is this technique even called? Because I haven't u- seen that idea used too much in machine learning. Right. So I, that's uh, so that's a technique that's you know been used for the last few years. I think it became popular with uh, this uh, lab in uh, University of Washington with Brunton and Kutz. And they call it, you know, equation discovery or equation learning. And I mean, there is a few names for it, but uh, so and using sparse regularization, that's the whole point. So the idea is basically, um, let's say you have a differential equation for a function u. Okay, u is a function of t. Um, and you can be any equation. So it's so I have du dt, that's my derivative in time. So how u changes in time is equal to a sum of terms usually for example you can have the x uh, i mean first derivative in x second derivative in x maybe u times the first derivative in x that's a, non, a bit mixed nonlinear. so you have a bunch of terms right so now let's say i have a simulation for you and i don't know the equation of u i don't know what simulator solved it and i want to discover what are the sum of these terms and their coefficients right so I take the data of you because I have the data, I have the simulation solution, and I compute numerically the derivatives. I compute u, du dx, I compute the second derivative of x. I can, so all of these, each one of these, now I can compute also u squared, u cubed, u times u, ux, et cetera. And each one of these terms is now a feature in my dictionary. Mm-hmm. And the question is, which one of these features are relevant uh, so first, I want the, the derivatives that don't play a role in my solution to be zero. And that's why I used L1 regularization. Uh-huh. I want to estimate what the coefficients are. So like, you know, what are the values? And it seems that, you know, it works for some equations, even nonlinear equations. I can rediscover the equations from the simulation data. 
I mean, that's crazy and, because, because that also kind of gives you, like, even if you're predicting uh, existing equations, that's still an interesting research direction because at least it further validates that, yes, indeed, the data does support this formula as the simplest possible formula to describe right. this phenomena. So you don't even need to describe stuff if you can reverse engineer existing formulas. Exactly. Uh, that, that's also important. Interesting. Right. So it's actually like I found, for example, that I had a simulator that computes some some solution. And I wanted to debug it to know like if it's actually computing the equation that I, I encoded or because it's, it's a, you know, it's a code I got and I adjusted it and I wanted to see if it works. So I, I took the solution and I ran it through this algorithm and I recovered the equation and I recovered an equation, right? And the equation was different than the one I thought I was solving. So it turns out, you know, I was, so there's something wrong with that simulator. And so it's like, you know, reverse engineering a simulator, right? So you get the solution and you want to know what the equation that solves that solution is. And this is really what, you know, physics wants to do. Like you have the experimental data, um, which now can be actually simulation data. And then you want to get the equation that solves this, that, that get, gives you that experimental data. This is, this, is, this is excellent. Like, because like for, for me, like, like synthetic data is, I believe, like one of the most promising uh, research directions for machine learning. Like, let's say in the example of, uh, I want to, you know, build some sort of image recognition model to recognize like barcodes from like products in a supermarket shelf. Well, like I can create these fake products in like a game engine like Unity and then use this as fake data to then train a model, which can probably generalize pretty well to real data if you vary, like, let's say, conditions like the lighting in the supermarket, the colors of the objects, the contrast. Uh, so so how, how does this work in physics? Like, like, what are some techniques to make sure that your uh, simulation generalizes to, to the real world? Yeah, that's a that's a good point. That uh, so let's say, I mean, the, the problem I described. I have an equation, the U D T equals some something, right? And uh, um, so in some cases, actually, if I just have one initial condition and I run the simulation and I have some function as a function of time, some something that evolves in time, I can run it through the algorithm and I get the exact equation back. But that sometimes it doesn't generalize over all initial conditions. So I have to, you know, sample different initial conditions, have different varied initial conditions that will give me different uh, uh, solutions. And then from the solutions, I can learn even better. So that's kind of adding data to your, to your learning algorithm and it will give you a better estimate of the equation. Sometimes changing the inputs will give you a different equation. So you will, you will realize how, you know, your equation will change as a function of your inputs. So uh, this, this, for example, happens in fluids, for example, let's say, so this work has been done uh, where you have a plate and then you have a fluid flowing through over the plate. And traditionally there's, uh, I mean, it's known that there is a boundary layer. So there's a layer of fluid above the plate that's turbulent and, and some parts turbulent, some parts laminar, and then in some other parts, you know, it becomes the same as the flow above it, etc. So uh, there's a theory for that. So what they did is they did the simulation using every stocks of this whole thing. And then in this spots where it's laminar, you can get an equation for a laminar flow. In the spots where it's turbulent, you can get an equation for a turbulent, I mean, more general equation, you need it. But in places where your solution is simple, you'll get a simple equation, or a simplified equation at least. And this in physics has been done before by hand, where you'd say, oh, look here, the solution is simple, so I don't need this term in the equation. I, I'll just get rid of it. Zero it out, yeah. So, you can do it with data. You can say, well, tell me which terms in the equation are important here. And then you can discover again the equation where the terms are important. So it, it almost sounds to me like, you know, let's kind of like, I mean, obviously, I believe like making predictions about the future is generally not too fruitful. Uh, but but I think like an interesting one I'd like to uh, at least get your take on is uh, like the way we've kind of been teaching physics. And so it seems to me now, like the way we teach physics is like, I tell you, like, here's a formula, like someone really smart figured it out. Uh, and then you plug it into problems and you solve these problems. But now, like, I think if we're taking this data driven approach, it seems like the exact formulas are almost irrelevant. And what's more relevant is the problem formulation as a data problem. And second, like an understanding of how like differential equation solvers work. So at least you can interpret the output of these models. Uh, so yeah, like like I guess like ten years down the future, like do you see physics classes looking very different from what they look like today? 
<laughs> unfortunately, I don't think they will change much just because, uh, because I mean, I mean, look at the last century, like we had, you know, relativity uh, and nonlinear sciences, a lot of revolutions actually that happened in physics and in sciences in general, and they're not taught at school. And, and even though they're very important to how we do science nowadays. Uh, so education is very slow in change and they just want to teach the basic things so that students can at some point get into the marketplace. If the marketplace needs more general uh, teaching, maybe machine learning will change that. But I think, uh, you know, what I would like, how I would like uh, education to change is something that machine learning actually brought to light, which is uh, the fact that, you know, science it's not something that's given to us. It's not uh, made of universal laws that you know come out of nowhere that we just purely discover. They're actually, it's actually we collect data and then we try to fit something to the data and then we test it and we test it until it fails and then we try to generalize it. So it's a very dynamic process that uh, you know. And I think you know teaching physics in this way, where we're putting it in a historical context where you know we discover certain things then we try to generalize them then they fail again and then we generalize them even better and then constantly we're changing perspective of how the world works it changes the whole philosophy of you know what the physical world world is i mean in classical physics it was thought that everything is mechanical but then in quantum physics that changed com completely everything and then with nonlinear sciences uh, you know the idea that you had an equation, therefore you can predict everything in the future also fails because you can actually solve this equation, but it's very unpredictable. It looks random at some point. So, so you know, changing the philosophy. And I think physics, physics should be taught in this way, in, in a way of like, you know, how knowledge evolves and how our assumptions are constantly being proven wrong. And I think this, this ingredient is missing in, in physics education in general. Uh, I, I mean, f f for me, I, I think you kind of summarized a lot of the I, like you kind of summarized a lot of the ideas that we were floating around this discussion very succinctly with the one sentence where you said, like, you don't believe that science is a sort of like universal uh, top down process. It's like an iterative process where you update your beliefs based on data. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I think I'll definitely remember that sentence. and I'll probably repeat it to other people if, if you don't mind from now on. No uh, problem. <laughs> but uh, but I think like, like uh, at least like based on on my personal experience, like uh, I had the experience uh, over Christmas to teach a bit of math to my uh, seven year old nephew. Uh, and so I got him a Raspberry Pi. And one of my observations was that he could, for example, learn what a multiplication was by plugging numbers into a computer as opposed to having to know what the mechanical process of multiplication is before he can actually carry it out. So kind of like abstract away the uh, details and kind of focus on the high level understanding. Well, like this is like a more efficient way to add numbers. And uh, I think to see that happen for physics would be incredible. Like I think uh, ultimately I would like, let's say, uh, you know, like if I was designing a physics class from scratch today, what I would like to see is, you know, maybe instead of like someone telling me that the optimal angle to fire a cannonball is 45 degrees, like I could play around in a simulator and see for myself, you know, and, and derive this conclusion by myself and then go back to the formulas and see like, right. and be like, oh, OK, well, I, I see now how this works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think that's sort of. Um, I mean, the, my English teacher used to tell me, like, all you need to do to, to motivate your students or like for good teaching in general is to create the tension in the student's head and then leave him alone, right? So just like make him want to know why and then just he'll figure it out. Like you don't need to tell him, right? And then, and that's the idea is that like, you know, you play around with this angle of the cannonball and then you see like, Oh, the, the farthest is 45, but why? Like, you just want to know why. And then you'll go and figure it out. At the end of the day, I mean, all form of learning is self-learning. You'll, you'll have to understand why yourself. No one is going to tell you. I mean, pe teachers can make it easier for you, but that doesn't mean that they can actually make you learn, right? Like, the learning happens from you. And, uh, and so, and I think education is in this dilemma where, you know, they want to, teach you the fundamentals of why things happen. But while these things that are like, these whys are constantly changing, uh, but at the same time, you know, they know that the purpose of this why is to have a real application. So this is like this very theoretical or very application based uh, 
uh, and and you know good people who are good at science or any field they're very comfortable going from very theoretical ideas to very application to very like real world application ideas to navigate through these you know different scales of uh, you know theory to application and i mean um so it's i don't think it makes sense to teach students you know this is a theory this is an application and that's it like that's all you know like you just need this theory to apply to these things that you need it's you know i i don't know how you know some students are just not motivated to learn so i don't know you can't really force people to learn but definitely this navigation through theory to application is would be very good to have in all i mean all forms of education it, it, it's interesting because like I've, I've definitely felt that uh like so for, for i for one for example have been a proponent of homeschooling for a couple of years now and i remember very distinctly my uh, friends and family thinking i was insane uh, for th for suggesting that it would be a good approach but it seems like now it looks like it's not going to be as as insane anymore like it does sound like it's going to be uh, a realistic direction for, for people to be in um i mean yeah I, honestly like i'm excited for the future at this point at least when it when it comes to learning because like i feel that like at least i personally didn't grow up with the ability to use a computer to help me learn for me a computer was more of a consumption device uh growing up like it's like oh it's this thing i can play video games on and it has paint and that was like the extent of uh, my interest in it but i definitely i think like looking back there was a lot more stuff i could have done with it and and i think the so, like, like the sort of dogma of the education system made that more challenging because you're spending a lot of time in school. You have homework, you have exams, you need to apply to colleges. And so like your free time is essentially uh, not yours. Uh, and, and so I guess like, I mean, so, so let's say when you talk to people that don't believe that self-learning is realistic, that maybe have uh, more inherent pessimism with the way they view humans, like do you, uh well what's your response to these people like is there something they're missing or do you think different people are different i mean i think part of it so there are a lot of so people who really enjoyed school will probably not agree with you right they will be like no i mean i really enjoyed it i want my children to also enjoy it and uh people who, who were really dissatisfied sometimes dissatisfied with it will probably agree with you like no i hated it and <laughs> i wanted to change and the reasons could be different. Some people enjoyed it because they had really good teachers. I mean, if they had really good teachers, of course, they would enjoy it. Some people didn't enjoy it because it doesn't like, I mean, if you're discovery or uh, project driven, like you like to, you know, do things on your own and discover things on your own, play with things by hand, the things that the schools don't do, you probably will not enjoy it. And so, you know, in some cases, it's hard to change people's opinions, but like my experience with my girlfriend, for example, uh, where she was really good at school and she enjoyed school. But then I would tell her all these stories about like nonlinear sciences, quantum mechanics, all these things that they don't teach at school that I think are really exciting. And I managed to get her excited about it, about them, about this. Mm -hmm. And she's like, whoa, I mean, how, why didn't they tell us this at school? Like that doesn't make sense. And and then she's like, oh yeah, maybe we should do homeschooling because mm -hmm. it's just because that, you know, people don't know about the exciting things that you can do outside of school they think that you know everything that could have been learned was learned at school and a lot of people they don't want to go through that experience again or they probably don't trust uh, you know something unconventional to do the education i mean after all you know like the whole country or the whole world has the same education system why would you change that i mean obviously it's the best that's why <laughs> that's why they use it uh, and that's the assumption, right? But uh, it's very hard to question that assumption. So, so Joe, thank you so much. Like, this was amazing. I, I, I guess, like, my parting thought will be that, like, it's probably more important to keep a joy of discovery as opposed to favor, like, just acquiring knowledge for, for the sake of it. Because I think, like, you end up optimizing over more interesting problems. Um, honestly, that this was amazing. Like, I think I, I learned so much chatting with you today. So thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I definitely, you know, will have a very different view viewpoint of science from now on, just because the fact that you've told me that it is basically a data driven approach makes me feel a lot more confident that I can understand more parts of it. <clears throat> and it makes me more optimistic that 
science science will be a better career choice because it's going to be more lucrative given that there is sort of a cross section of applications with machine learning um so this was all great joe thank you so yeah, much man you're the thank best you. thank you too i think i also really enjoyed our conversation as usual actually and i hope uh, we have more of them <laughs> yeah i I, th I think so too I'll, I'll definitely have you on again because this was great i think we'll i'll probably increase like uh, I'll, I'll have a better setup you know better animations better more polished but i think in terms of content this was extremely solid so thank you so much great. yeah thank you too all right